a, a thing to bear in mind, uh, sort of related to what you were saying, is uh, disease, which we accept as part of life, is actually something fairly unusual in nature. Uh, the only places in nature where y you see uh, a lot of disease happening is in insects. Insects are highly subject to viruses and there's a huge family of insect viruses. This is the basis of many pesticide design strategies is to, is to spray crops with viruses that attack insects. Um, the other area uh, in the animal world where you see a lot of disease is human beings and the animals they have domesticated so that cattle, pigs, poultry, and people are all fairly subject to disease. But for instance, uh, birds of prey are not greatly subject to disease. Many fewer diseases, uh, uh, fish, all, all animal groups have some susceptibility to, be, to diseases, but really human beings and insects seem to be the most set up for this. And the reason that is advanced for this is that these are the social animals, the insects and the human beings. And wherever you have intense social activity, not, I mean, for instance, in some species, uh, a male and a female will encounter each other only once in the life of each individual, then have sex, and that's it. You know, there is no social life. Well, so that's no, no disease can get a foothold there because diseases require transmission and contact. Diseases want to be able to move from one person to another. The reason I mention this is because the rise of this susceptibility to disease is something that apparently also was going on at the same time that we were acquiring language beginning to domesticate animals, switching our diet. What we really are are the uh, evolutionary wreckage of a very chaotic and crazy series of uh, uh, pattern shifts that went on between 50 and 100,000 years ago. Now we are the inheritors of that. Very interesting, as long as I'm on this subject, very interesting relationship between disease and spirituality because uh, pilgrimage sites are the great disease vectors of the ancient world. I mean, you can imagine, here you have a temple, everybody comes there to get cured, mm -hmm. and everybody comes there and, go and leaves sick and because... All these infected people have been there. There's a wonderful book, I can't remember the author, but the title is Plagues and Peoples. And uh, it's a study of epidemiology and the history of disease and its impact on uh, human populations. And uh, uh, very interesting and has a lot to say, I think, about uh, psychedelic use as well by implication because... Uh, uh, psychedelic use also brings people together under very uh, close and intimate circumstances many times. Well, it, in a sense, I mean, I see AIDS as the inevitable consequence of the, the ocean-crossing airliner. You know, uh, always sites of pilgrimage were sites of disease conveyance. And... Uh, uh, any virus worth its salt would jump into this situation and exploit it. Now, as to the darker side of the AIDS thing in terms of, you know, was this a product of human engineering or human intent or so forth and so on, it, it, that's an interesting question, but in a way, uh, it really doesn't matter. It's, an, it's a product of human behavior. And I don't mean I don't mean simply uh, sexual or homosexual behavior. I mean such behaviors as travel, pilgrimage, the wish to mix it all up. I mean, think of the gene streaming that is taking place in the 20th century. 
I mean, I mean, I know a Tibetan married to an Egyptian woman, and stuff like that's going on all over the map. Uh, so there's all kinds of uh, of uh, crises. When we were a nomadic community, the transmission of disease was retarded by the fact that human groups didn't really come into that much contact with each other. I mean, when you're in a place like Terminal 1 at Heathrow, and you just look around you, I mean, my God, you know? I mean, uh, Muslim priests, Tibetan lamas, Botswana dignitary, I mean, and people are just swarming and swarming and swarming and using the bathrooms and coughing. And, and in these airliners, when they fly over the ocean, when they fly above 30,000 feet, they recycle the air in such a way that if there's one person who has a problem, 275 people are having their immune systems on red alert by the time you get to Tokyo or New York. Not to rave, but... <laughs> we are monkeys, and monkeys love a hell of a good fight. And we have a hell of a fight bearing down on us because we have to clean up the mess. We are going to, we're not going to go silently into the gentle night of extinction. There, it, it's just not going to happen that way. Creativity is going to be unleashed. Struggle is going to be uh, an unavoidable part of trying to steer this battleship away from the cataracts of history in which we are now caught.